Welcome everyone this morning to the Kiwana United Methodist Church. As we begin, would you bow with me in prayer? Father oh God, we're so grateful that we're able to gather here this morning together in this church, in this sanctuary, to humbly proclaim your name, to worship you, to exalt you. And so, Lord, we ask as we dedicate this time of song and reading and preaching that you anoint this time, that you bless it, that you use it to open our minds and our hearts, to forever change our lives, our perspective, our outlook, so that when we walk back through these doors and go about our daily lives, we were, will be truly and forever change. We thank you for Jesus, our precious Lord and Savior. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. Worship from a familiar psalm. Psalm 23, uh, verses 1 through 6. So many of you have heard this and may wonder how it pertains to the message and the flow of the rest of the service this morning. Stay tuned. I think as time goes on, you'll understand. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Thanks, Jared. Let me see if I can, if this helps. Does that help everyone? Yeah. Well, hear these words from David in his song. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall, come, shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let us pray these words, the Lord's Prayer this morning together, shall we? Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy will, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture comes from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. As we look at the fellowship of believers and the example that we're given here in the book of Acts of the early church. So here are these words from the book of Acts, starting at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship of to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Every day they continued to meet together 
in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And as a result, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father God, as the psalmist wrote, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, of our hearts, be pleasing to you, to you. For Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, welcome back to week two of the sermon series entitled, We Are Gathered Here. And what an interesting time, I think, that God has chosen to lay upon my heart uh, to preach about a series about gathering when so much is up in the air on whether or not we can, in fact, uh, gather. But I know that the Lord is working, and I know that with the state of our, our country, the state of our community, the state of our church, not even a pandemic can, can extinguish what we have and prevent us from gathering in some form or another. We're so blessed to have cameras and internet and the mediums that we have with social media to, to come together and gather still, even if it's telephones and uh, writing letters. Uh, so here are these words from our second series on why we are gathering, where we talk about gathering for rhythm, for that habit. And so many of you heard, uh, or you guys heard me talk to the kids about um, habits. And so I would pose the same question to you. What habits do you have? Can you think about your habits? Now when I think about that question, the first knee-jerk reaction that I have are the habits, as I mentioned, that are bad. Um... When I think about habits and someone asks me what habits you have, my mind, my mind instantly goes to the negative. But that's not really the case, is it, for all of us? Not all habits are bad. In fact, there's actually, in regards to habits, more deeply ingrained in them things that are more deeply ingrained in them than, than you might think. The, uh, there was an article put out, the, Psycholo the Psychology of Habits, that was put out by a website, theworldcounts.com. And I want to read to you what they say about habits. Habits are our brain's way of increasing its efficiency. Our brain turns daily actions and behaviors into habits. So we would do them automatically and without too much thought, thus freeing up our brain power for other more important challenges. This strategy of our brain has wonderful benefits for us. It allows us to function better in life. Can you imagine, the article says, if you had to consider and ponder every single task or reaction, you'd be exhausted. Now, isn't that true? So, good or bad, right or wrong, habits are powerful. In fact, we know it's hard to shake off bad habits. Many of you can attest to that. In fact, studies show that it takes an average of 66 days before a new habit can take root in our brain. Now, many of you have heard, and I have heard this in the past as well, that it takes 21 days to make a new habit. But it actually takes three times as long for that habit 
that same habit, that new habit, to take root, to become an integrated part <coughs> of our lives. Now, with that little nugget in your possession, I, I got one other thing that I'd like to offer to you about habits. Habits follow cravings as they seek rewards. Think about that for a second. Think, for instance, about the habit of smoking. If you really want to stop the habit of smoking, but you don't address the cravings and the rewards contributing to that habit, then you will have an incredibly difficult time kicking that habit. Wouldn't you agree? Now, on the same token, if we desire to create new habits, healthy habits, we also need to address the underlying cravings and rewards that contribute to them. Now, in regards to those cravings uh, and our Christian lifestyle, let me ask you these questions. Do you crave healthy, God-honoring relationships with others? Do you earnestly desire a consistent and prayerful, powerful prayer life? Are you hungry for a deeper understanding of the Word and the teachings of Jesus? One has to wonder, what would your faith look like and how different might it be if you really craved fellowship, craved communion, craved worship and prayer. Now how could we use the healthy rhythm of gathering and fellowship with other believers to help us to develop habits of faith and all of those things that I referenced above, the things that I believe for many of us we have craved at one time or another or possibly still are craving. Listen, believers, the early church, what I just read in the book of Acts, they knew something about gathering together. They knew something, in fact, that they did so well that churches and communities and faith groups have been modeling for years and years and years since the first time that they gathered. And we see in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 what is said about the way that they gathered. We see that they were devoted and they devoted themselves to teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of the bread, and to prayer. In fact, these things, ultimately then, this healthy rhythm that, that created these things of teaching, or that were, uh, th that they, that you saw them doing, teaching fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer, Those things were a, a result of the healthy rhythm and habit that they got into. It was because of that rhythm and habit that these things became fruitful. God bless. But the key here is the fact that as the scripture tells us in verse 42, they were devoted that word devotion is a powerful one. By definition, it means to consistently show strength which prevails in spite of difficulties. To endure, to stay fixed and in a fixed direction, to be steadfast. The church, they were unwavering in their commitment to gather together for those things of teaching fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. 
In fact, we see, as I read, a few verses after the verse, 40, verse 42 and verse 46, that that same word of devotion is used as it said that they continue, they persevere daily in meeting together. Powerful. Now, in regard to that model, the model of the early church, I'd like to take just a few moments to look at those things, teaching, and, and the rest of those that I mentioned, and how those made the church and the gathering and the rhythm stronger, and how their devotion paid dividends in the end. How many of you like or enjoy learning? Anyone? I like to learn new things, things that I didn't know. The, the reward of good teaching is learning. And learning the scriptures, really learning the scriptures together with other believers, was something that the early church was absolutely devoted to. Learning, though, as many of you know, it takes time. It can be difficult. It requires a lot of effort and attention. But the reward, however, as many of you know, and especially in regard to learning the scriptures and learning about God, is a deeper understanding, a deeper knowledge. I really don't know that I can think of any believer or follower of Christ who would say that they don't want a deeper understanding of the scriptures, their faith, and ultimately of God. Most want to go deeper. And so teaching is vitally important as we gather. Now fellowship, gathering together, was the other thing that they were devoted to. And as I mentioned, the early church was devoted and steadfast into meeting I said the word daily. Now, <laughs> I'm not going to say that we need to gather in a formal service like this one every day. But what I would encourage is everyone to think about getting together in some form or format with other believers on a routine basis. As I mentioned, we have all of these things that we can use to stay connected, to still gather. It's vitally important that we use these avenues. I can't wait for the day when things can get back to normal so that we don't have to worry about uh, utilizing those other platforms. But since we're here and this is where we're at, and this is where God has brought us, we need to remember that those are available to us. That we need to utilize those things that even now more than ever, the fellowship of one another, the encouragement of one another is extremely important and not taken lightly. It was easy for me during the time of uh, quarantine to uh, become uh, kind of introverted, not reach out or talk with anyone. And as a result, I feel like my faith suffered to a degree. Not being able to gather with or talk or communicate with other believers. And many of you remember how wonderful it was that first Sunday back. To get back in the community and in the midst of other believers. If things go awry in the coming weeks, remember that feeling. Use that feeling to drive you. To keep you devoted, as the scriptures say, to, to the fellowship. Now, the breaking of the bread. Communion is incredibly important. And why is it that the early church was so stubborn? And they stubbornly devoted themselves and their time to the breaking of bread. Well, the answer to that is an answer that we need to remember. We read it in our liturgy as well as it's found in the scriptures. 
One of the places it's found in scriptures is in the book of 1 Corinthians where we see this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, you know it, he took the bread and when he had the bread, he gave thanks and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in, what did he say? Remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, remember? It's in the scriptures. And he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood given for you. And whenever you drink this cup, what did he say? Do this in, again, remembrance of me. And so communion for us is much, much deeper than just remembering, but remembering is a part of it. Remembering Jesus' life, remembering his sacrifice on the cross, his body broken for you and for me, his blood, his death, his resurrection, and his promise to not leave us nor forsake us, but in fact to come back to return again one day for his church. And so these are the realities that we see in communion. The rea realities that we as believers simply cannot forget. And because of communion, we understand all of these things and that sacrifice and we remember those things. And communion is something that we implicitly should do with others. It's something that we do to celebrate and remember together. Think about this. Communion is a common union amongst believers. Communion just isn't celebrated here in Kiwana. In fact, it's just not really celebrated in the Methodist Church. Anyone who proclaims Jesus as their Lord and Savior and acknowledges the Scriptures as as the word of God celebrates communion. What an amazing gift we have in Jesus. Through whom we share. Not only communion. But the eternal reward. Of salvation. Now the last thing that the church was. Dedicated or devoted to was prayer. Now prayer, many of us know what it is and how it works. And there have been many a sermon that was dedicated just to prayer. And I'm not going to do that today. But prayer is a gift. A gift that we have given to us by God for ourselves and to be shared amongst the community. We've seen it. There's power when we pray. When we make our requests known together to God, there's prayer, there's power in that. And whenever anyone asks for advice on how they should pray or what they should pray, I always turn them back to the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, an example given to us many, many years ago by Jesus Himself on how we should pray. A prayer that all of us here, I know, knows by heart. It's memorized word for word. But let me ask you something that you maybe have never thought about in regard to the Lord's Prayer. Have you ever thought about the communal nature of this prayer? Have you ever noticed that Jesus doesn't instruct us to pray using personal pronouns. Those pronouns like my or me. In fact, in the prayer we use plural pronouns like our and us. Friends, just know that the most famous prayer of all time is a communal prayer. It is meant to be spoken about in the midst of fellowship with others. And it is certainly meant to be spoken 
in the fel in, with the fe with fellowship in mind. There's power when we pray. And when we are committed to praying together, when we come together in prayer, those of you who know and can attest, there's something special that happens. So as I wrap up today, I, would, I want to revisit something that I mentioned to you last week. You may have remember that I read to you the scripture in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, where it talks about the people who's developed a habit of not meeting together. You remember it said, let us meet together, or let us not give up meeting together as some are in habit of doing. And I also said this, that for all the benefits we receive in fellowship, it's deeper than that. We gather together because it's who we are. Remember that? When adversity comes to our doorstep, when things don't go our way, when we seem confused and frustrated and angry, we join with others as we gather in fellowship to spur each other on towards love, good deeds. And we do that because that's who we are. And that is true, but it's also true, friends, and I, want you, I don't want you to look over the fact that there are numerous and wonderful benefits that we experience when we come together. We learn, we remember, we fellowship, and we pray, just to name a few. And as we see in our scripture today, in the book of Acts, the early church was absolutely committed to these practices. And I've got to believe that they knew a thing or two about the habits that were needed to preserve the life of the church, to preserve their lives through all the dif difficulties and adversities that they faced. So this is my challenge for each of you this week. I would like you to identify your habits, your rhythms. And once those are identified, I would ask you to, I would, I would, I would want you to ask yourselves, are they positive? Now by rhythm and habit, I mean those things that you do every morning, those things that you do every evening, that you do every day, those things that you are passionate about. And so in thinking of those, is there anything about those that you would change? I also want you to think about your personal rhythm of gathering and those that you may know that are out of the rhythm or habit of gathering with other believers on a regular basis. I would ask you to think of those for yourself and ask why is it that you or they are out of the rhythm? Are there past hurts, maybe? Fears? Or other things that are maybe robbing you or they of the rich rewards, really, that we see and experience in the fellowship Those are the things that I would like and challenge you to search deeply within, to see, to discern, and to come to grips with in your talking and praying with God this week. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, it's sometimes hard to come to grips with reality. And when you convict us, at times it's painful. But it needs to be done. We know it. 
So, Lord, my prayer as we enter into this next week is that you give us wisdom to identify any unhealthy habits that we may have and that you also give us the strength to change them. Lord, I pray as well that you give us the sweet fellowship with others this week no matter, no matter what form that may come in. And that we continue to stay in the practice, the habit, the rhythm of gathering together. We thank you for this time and we thank you for this message. And we thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.